Safety Science Opportunities in North Carolina. Tonight we'll be going over four ways you can count birds for science this winter and have fun and make new friends while you're at it. My name is Ben Graham. I'm with Audubon North Carolina and we're co-hosting this tonight with the folks at the North Carolina Bird Atlas. You'll meet some of them shortly um, and we'll talk more about the Bird Atlas in a bit. Uh, but as we get started here, I wanted to start off by asking everyone to find the chat box or if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and find the comment section. And I'm gonna have you answer three questions. So first type in and let us know where you're watching from. Uh, a standard question at the beginning of these things. But next, I'd like you to type in and ask or and tell us a bird that you're most excited about seeing this winter. And the third, the third question, and most importantly, let us know how many years you've been counting birds. So go ahead and type that in the chat box, Facebook comment section. Ooh, tundra swans, snowy owl. There are some good ones in here. I'd say some of those are on my list. That's great. Keep them coming. So uh, that last question that I asked, how many years you've been counting birds, is particularly important tonight. It's something that I've, we're going to be emphasizing throughout the webinar, um, and that is because these community science projects are for everyone. It doesn't matter if you've been birding for 50 years or if you just started to learn the birds at your backyard feeder yesterday. There are a ton of ways to get involved, to get outside and enjoy birds this winter, and to give back while you're doing it. And this is for people of all experience levels. Um, so, you know, I, I say that this is about giving back while you're, while you're also enjoying birds. Um, and so I want to say a little bit what I mean by that. So when you go outside and watch birds and then report what you see through one of these community science programs that we're going to talk about, those bird observations contribute to science. They help us better understand what's happening with birds, the threats they face, and how we can help them. So that's kind of why we do what we do um, when we talk about these programs tonight. So, so the four community science programs are, and I'll list these in order that you'll hear about them tonight, and also the order in which they'll take place over the winter. The first is the Audubon Christmas Bird Count. The second is Climate Watch. And the third is the Great Backyard Bird Count. The fourth is the North Carolina Bird Atlas, which I mentioned earlier. And this is kind of the newest project on the scene. And it's also one that you can do throughout the winter and while you're doing these other community science projects. And so we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, one second. Um, and something else I want to note up top, uh, and I just started a live transcription there. Ken, can you make sure that that's... Okay, great. Yep. Um, something else just to note at the top is that all of these programs are free. And I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it many more times, they're open to folks of all experience levels. All you have to do is sign up to get involved. Um, so you'll get a lot of information tonight about each of these projects, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end with a bunch of panelists. Um, and we'll be posting links in the chat box throughout to give you more information, ways to sign up and get involved. And then we'll also send all of those links to you in an email tomorrow. So don't worry if you miss something, if you don't get to copy a link down fast enough, we'll get you all the information you need. And then this webinar will be available in perpetuity on Facebook, on our on the Audubon North Carolina Facebook page, so you can go back and watch it again. And I should also note, because we always get questions about this, you don't need a Facebook account to access the video. So all this information, you'll get all of it. Uh, I know it might feel like a lot, but you'll get all of it and have an opportunity to go back and go through it. Um, so that's it. That's my intro. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kim Brand. Kim is Audubon's Director of Engagement in North Carolina, and she's going to talk with us about the long history of the Christmas bird count and how you can get involved. So Kim, uh, go ahead and take it away and I'll advance the slideshow. Great. Thank you, Ben. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I love I love your ideas in the chat box of the birds you want to see. Sydney, I'm with you looking for weird ducks definitely this winter. Um, so welcome. Again, my name is Kim Brand. And first up for ways to count birds for science this winter is the longest running bird census in the United States, the Audubon Christmas Bird Count. And it began back in the year 1900. So we're doing it for the 122nd time this year. Um, and it takes place starting in about two weeks, December 14th through January 5th. 
And it's it's truly a birding tradition um, and really an important ritual for, for lots of us and hopefully will be for you all who are doing it the first time. I hope you love it and keep coming back to do it. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So the Audubon Christmas bird count is truly our our most important uh, data set of winter birds, of where birds are in the winter. For the Western Hemisphere, 20 countries do the Audubon Christmas bird count. Um, and these ducks are, are just uh, to signify one of hundreds of scientific articles that have been published based on Christmas bird count data. Um, this was from a paper published this year that showed from 50 years of Christmas bird count data that 16 species of common southern ducks are wintering farther north uh, than they did 50 years ago because of warming temperatures. So when you sign up to do the Christmas bird count or any of these uh, community science programs, you're really making a difference and contributing to science and it's really important. Next slide, please. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the Audubon Christmas bird count? And the Audubon Christmas bird count is a whole bunch of 15 mile diameter circles. These are established and uh, we have about 55 of these circles in North Carolina. You can see on the map and each one of these circles has a compiler who's a volunteer in charge of organizing the volunteers who go out and do the counting. So the compiler will choose a date. Um, it's a 24 hour count, so volunteers can go out anytime in that 24 hours um, and they'll each have assigned places to go within the circle on that day. And each team is led by an experienced birder so that if you're doing this for the first time, rest assured that, you know, your local compiler is going to put you in, in touch with a team leader who's responsible for knowing where to go. Um, and adding up the bird tallies and helping everybody identify birds by sight and by sound. So what the teams do is they simply go out. They might they might start in the morning in the dark listening for owls. Um, certainly we'll do some traveling around on foot listening and looking for birds. Um, there may be some seated portions of the Christmas bird count. Um, and also some travel by car, perhaps, you know, some routes, uh, people simply drive around, stop, get out of the car, find, find the birds they can find, and then move on. So there's lots of variety. And it's all, again, it's all organized based around teams. Um, and each team, uh, it's important to note, not only counts the bird species that they detect, but also um, how many individual birds they get. So it's a really great count uh, and a really great representation of where birds are in the winter. Um, again, super important to emphasize, uh, to sign up, you will uh, follow the link that we're gonna put in the chat box in a moment that goes to this map and you'll click on the circle, find the date for the count you wanna do, and you'll also find there the name and the email address of the compiler. So send them a note. Let them know you want to get into it. Right now is perfect. The first counts are just two weeks away. Um, so it's a really good moment to, to pick a count and go ahead and sign up, get assigned to a team, um, find out where you're meeting everyone. Um, I do want to make a couple notes about access. You'll notice a couple of these circles are red. Um, that's because there's a few circles um, where the compiler has made the decision to cancel the count this year due to the pandemic. Um, the counts that are happening, which is the vast majority of them, Audubon is just asking everyone uh, to remain socially distant outdoors, or if you can't, go ahead and wear a mask. Um, and certainly any part of the count that's indoors, occasionally you'll get to go like inside an Audubon member's home for coffee to watch their feeders and to warm up. Um, any counting that goes on indoors, Audubon's asking people to wear masks uh, at that time as well. So follow local guidelines. Um, one other note about access, um, our lovely partners at BirdAbility, which is a nonprofit dedicated to expanding birding access to everybody, uh, regardless of physical or other challenges. Um, they have published some really cool guidelines specifically for the Audubon Christmas bird count on how to make that a little bit more accessible. So I encourage you, you know, if you need to remain seated while you count birds, we would love to have you join the Audubon Christmas bird count. You know, whatever whatever your needs are, there's probably a way that you can easily contribute to the Audubon Christmas bird count. So please do. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. 
this is uh, this is my Audubon Christmas bird count team. I think it's two years ago, um, but it, I think it just really I hope it captures you like how how fun it is to catch up with everybody on your team. Um, you know, on any given team, there's people who've been sort of counting at those that that park that territory for years. Um, and this team on the left, it's Craig McCleary. I always look forward to seeing Craig and laughing at his jokes. Um, and then in this picture, um, there's also two people doing the bird count for the very first time ever. Um, Hannah Adair, uh, those of you watching from Forsyth Audubon tonight will recognize Hannah, who's become a wonderful chapter leader. Um, and then my daughter, Josie, uh, she also had a blast. So know that if you're doing this for the first time, um, you're gonna make it more fun for the people who've been doing this for years or decades. They're gonna be really excited because you're there. I'll also close with the advice I got on my first Christmas bird count 20 years ago. It was the Lake Placid, Florida <laughs> count. Um, and the advice is simply as a beginner to keep your eyes up, keep looking up because um, the more experienced bird counters are gonna be invariably trying to find a tiny rare bird in a thicket. <laughs> and they're going to miss the fact that there's a bald eagle flying over your head. So um, that's your job. Keep your eyes up, keep your ears open, and have a great time. Next, so type your questions about the Christmas bird count into the chat box, and we'll get to those later. Um, next up, we have Matt Jansen, who started birding with Mecklenburg Audubon around age 12 or so lived the dream, went to Cornell University, has graduated and is now, uh, Matt, are you actually, you're not actually next, sorry. Next we no, have I'm Ben sorry. Graham. Yes. Yeah, next we have Ben Graham, who is also awesome. <laughs> For the Take sake of the order of the slack, <laughs> we'll stick to uh, the original order. <laughs> but you get to introduce Matt again in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, so thank you, Kim. Uh, great overview of the Christmas bird count, super fun event. I hope you all will sign up, get in touch with your local compiler. Um, now we're going to move from a century old community science project to one of our newer endeavors, and that is Climate Watch. Audubon started Climate Watch uh, somewhat recently, just in 2016, with the goal of figuring out how birds are being impacted by climate change. So we look at how birds are shifting the ranges or changing their breeding and wintering activity across the state. Uh, this project takes place twice a year in January and February. You see the dates right th up there on the slideshow. And then again in May and June. So this will be coming up after the holidays. Um, before we get into how Climate Watch works, I wanted to give just a little more context and background on why we do it. Um, Audubon released in 2019, released a big climate report called Survival by Degrees. You see that up there on the slide. Um, and it looked at projected climate impacts on more than 600 bird species across North America. And the short story of what the report found is that 389 species are at risk of extinction because of climate change, including more than 200 bird species right here in North Carolina. And so the, the list of at-risk species isn't just far off birds in faraway places. It includes the birds that we all know and love, even the birds like goldfinches at your backyard feeder. Um, so the map up on the screen shows the projected range change for the wood thrush under different climate change scenarios. For those of you not as familiar, the wood thrush is a forest bird uh, that can sometimes be found in backyards. And it has just this beautiful song that to me is one of my favorite signs that spring is here. Uh, and it, it's found across North Carolina. So you can see in the maps that the wood thrush is expected to lose some of its range if temperatures rise by 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's that map in the middle. Um, and under the more severe warming scenario, which is the map to the far right, the wood, the wood thrush would see the vast majority of its habitat lost or severely degraded, including a lot of it in North Carolina. So that, that's, that's the bad news part of the report. The good news, which is also reflected in these maps, is that if we can hold temperature increases and reduce the worst impacts of climate change, we can help these birds, help the wood thrush, and the vast majority of species on this list. Uh, so that's kind of like the very quick and high level overview of Audubon's latest climate research. There's a lot there. It's a lot to dig into. Um, you can learn more on our website, and maybe Zach can drop the link to that website in the chat. 
But we're here to talk about Climate Watch tonight. So the way Climate Watch fits into all of this is uh, because it's our way of ground truthing our climate projections. So when participants go out and survey for birds as part of Climate Watch, they are essentially helping us test our hypothesis and figure out what's actually happening on the ground with birds. So um, that's the background. Now let's talk about how the survey actually works. So participants work with a local coordinator to select a square on a map near your home. We've already got the maps laid out, or the squares laid out on a map. Um, and this is the square, which you pick it, that you'll be surveying in. The squares are 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. So it's like um, six miles by six miles. Um, and at some point during the survey period, you go out and you survey 12 points within your square listening and watching for your target species for just five minutes at each point. And then you record your findings and report them on eBird. So participants survey these same 12 points within your, your little square twice a year, once in the winter, once in the spring. Um, so that's kind of the basics of it, but, but kind of the big take home point for me and one of the things I love most about Climate Watch is that it focuses on just a few species. So even if you're super new to identifying birds, all you have to do is learn to identify a short list or even just a single species by sight or by sound, and then you can get outside and participate. And your, uh, you know, your local coordinator can help you figure out the square and where your 12 points are. Uh, but the identifying birds part is the fun part, and it's super simple and easy in Climate Watch. So the target species that we look at um, are up here on the screen. These are the target species across the country, so not some of these birds aren't even in North Carolina. So in North Carolina, the birds that we're targeting are the nuthatches, so white-breasted nuthatch, red-breasted, and brown-headed nuthatches, eastern bluebirds, American goldfinches, eastern towhees, and painted muntings. But when you go out and join a climate watch survey, you're, you are essentially choosing one of these species and focusing on it. So super easy and fun way to, to learn one bird learn it well, and get out and start participating in community science. Um, what did I forget here? Uh, yeah, so the way to get started is by contacting the local coordinator or by contacting Kim, and we'll uh, drop, there's a web page. The web page was just dropped in the chat box that has Kim's contact info as well as the coordinator's contact info. So you just get in touch with them. Um, so that's kind of the, the quick high level overview. And I'll just say here and end it one more time that this is open to birders of all level. And in my opinion, this is a great one to get started. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is that your coordinator, if you are a less experienced birder, can uh, connect you with a more experienced birder. So you can go out with someone who can kind of help you out. Um, and in fact, when I've done Climate Watch, that's how it's worked. Uh, we've you know, gone out in pairs of twos or threes and kind of mixing and mashing, making sure we have a newer person and a more experienced person. Um, so super fun and uh, open to everyone. So uh, that, that's it on Climate Watch, Kim. I'm going to toss it back to you to talk about the Great Backyard Bird Count. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Highly recommend Climate Watch. It's so fun to get out there and listen for those squeaky nut hatches uh, twice a year. Great. So next up is probably our most uh, easy and straightforward community science project. It's called the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, it can be in your backyard. Um, can really be anywhere, just about anywhere on the globe. So it is actually a global uh, count. 190 countries. Uh, we're in on it last year. Uh, they counted six, more than 6,000 bird species, so more than half of the birds that are out there to be detected, um, and submitted 379,000 checklists. So it's just super fun. It happens every year, President's Day weekend, Friday through Monday. So 2022, it'll be February 18th through 21st. And you can essentially uh, count birds anywhere you want your backyard, a local park, uh, truly anywhere for at least 15 minutes. Uh, next slide, Ben, please. 
Here's a couple more details. So like I said, anywhere you want for at least 15 minutes um, and just any birds that you can identify. Um, count longer if you wish. Keep track of time. So that's an important theme um, throughout all of these community science programs. It's really important to record the effort that you put into detecting birds because that makes it a lot more um, helpful to the scientists who are going to be working with those data later. So not just what you detect, but also like how long you were searching. Um, and then you just simply give your best estimate on the number of individuals of each species that you observe. So your high count, say, for the, the 15 minutes that you're maybe uh, watching your feeder, um, if you saw 25 grackles at once, then that's the number you're going you're gonna to record. So it's super easy, super chill, and super fun. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. And then what you do with your observations, how long you watched and which birds you saw, is you enter them into a free platform called eBird. You do need to uh, set up a free eBird account if you don't have one already, and you will need to log in. Um, I, you can do this on your computer, um, but I highly recommend the eBird mobile app. It's fantastic. It's easy to use. Um, and if you just start that checklist, when you begin birding, it's going to keep track of time for you. Um, it will even track where you where you travel if you want it to. So it's it's just really simple and great um, and fun. It will also flag uh, rare sightings for you, so you can check yourself. Like was that definitely what I saw? So it's a really smart and easy to use tool. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you also oh. My people photo isn't there. Okay, well, imagine imagine a group of, of happy people of all ages together looking at birds. Um, great Backyard Bird Count is also a great way to get kids excited about birding. Really, really, it's sort of this starter community science program that, that is so fun to share with everyone. Um, so I encourage you to gather, gather in groups if you can, or um, some Audubon chapters and bird clubs organize events like at local libraries and with school children, um, those are great ways to get involved and just sort of spread the joy of appreciating birds um, and counting birds for science. Okay, I finally get to introduce Matt Jansen, um, who started birding with Mecklenburg Audubon around age 12. He told me earlier, uh, got a degree from Cornell, so living the bird dream, and is the regional coordinator for region one of the North Carolina Bird Atlas. So hanging out um, in the northeastern part of the state and the Outer Banks. Matt, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Kim. Thanks so much, Ben, for having us here to discuss the North Carolina Bird Atlas, which is a project um, that's spearheaded by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. It's a state agency that's designated to the protection and regulation of wildlife in the state of North Carolina. Uh, some of our partners on this project, you can see in the top right corner, which include Audubon, North Carolina. So thanks for having us. It's another citizen science project. It's one that's going to last um, through 2026. This year is our first year of the Bird Atlas. And you may be thinking, what is the Bird Atlas? So Bird Atlases, it's a conservation tool that they were developed about 40 or 50 years ago in North Carolina is conducting their first one starting this year. It's a way to basically analyze the status and distribution of birds throughout the state. Uh, we're a little unique in the fact that we're going to be having a breeding season component, but also the winter component. So right now, you can still be out contributing data to the breeding bird atlas, excuse me, to the North Carolina bird atlas. So one thing that you may be new to, luckily Kim just introduced it with the Great Backyard Bird Count, is the eBird portal. That's the exact same method that you're going to be using to log your sightings for the North Carolina Bird Atlas. It's really simple to use. There is the mobile app, and we just ask you to please make sure that you're entering your data through the North Carolina Bird Atlas portal. We'll have a little bit more information about that later. And so far, just this year, we already have over 36,000 checklists, over 870 volunteer atlasers, which probably includes some of y'all here on the call with us today. And we've confirmed over 180 species breeding in the state of North Carolina. And that's just in one summer. So we're really fortunate that we've already had quite a bit of really good data. Um, so you might say, how do we go about atlasing 
the way that we've standardized the protocol is there are 937 priority blocks, which are three miles bus, three miles square roughly. And you can see on my map here that they cover uh, most of the state um, is covered by a priority block. So, um, or there's one near you. Um, there's a couple areas like at Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune where we're letting the Department of Defense do the atlasing, but everywhere else, it's up to volunteers like you. So we're really looking forward to having participation in this project. All right, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so you might be asking, what are we focusing on right now during the winter time? Um, over the course of the Atlas, which is from now through 2026, there's an early wintering period, which is we've defined as the months of November and December. So what we're asking Atlasers to do over the course of that five-year period is to get out into the priority blocks and survey as many accessible habitats as you can. Sometimes that may be from a road, sometimes that may be from a local park, federal wildlife refuge, state game land, anything like that. We're aiming in this early winter period about five hours, at least five hours, of diurnal birding coverage for the um, periods of November and December. And that's not just in one year, that's through 2026. So you can try to knock out a couple blocks um, if you really are get bit by the atlasing bug you can um, make the opportunity to knock out a couple blocks for us um, each season. We're also asking for one nocturnal atlasing trip, which is becoming important this time of year because we can actually use the breeding codes, which are listed on eBird um, for some of those species like owls and um, woodcocks. They're starting to become active and display some breeding behaviors, uh, especially once towards the end of the month. Okay, um, another thing that we could be looking for this time of year are shrubby areas, edge habitats. They're going to be attracting wintering migrants, birds that winter in North Carolina, but they breed further north, oftentimes the boreal forest in the northern United States and southern Canada. Um, some very familiar species that y'all have been seeing in your yards the last couple of weeks that have already arrived are dark-eyed juncos and white-throated sparrows. So we'll be keeping tabs on those species. Also, uh, this time of year when insects are dying off with the freezes, birds are going to be concentrating around food sources like fruits, um, like you can see this picture of the cedar waxwing here. So that's something important to keep your eyes out for. You can find birds like waxwings and robins that often flock by those food sources. Finally, and this kind of relates to what Audubon is doing with the Climate Watch survey, is we want to note the birds that are wintering here more due to climate change. So as you probably know, North Carolina has a fairly mild winter climate. And there are some species like black and white warbler, blue-headed vireo that um, 50 years ago would not be found wintering here. They would continue to the Caribbean or Florida, Central America. Um, now, thanks to climate change, they're finding an environment that's relatively hospitable for them to spend the whole winter here in most of the state. So those uh, species like that, we're going to want to keep tabs on. All right, Ben, if we could go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Okay, so now that I've discussed the early winter period, uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about what's going on in the next section of late winter which is actually, you know, just coming up in about a month. Once the holiday season is over, we're going to be doing late winter atlasing. It's a similar protocol, what we're trying to do there. Survey the accessible habitats, have at least five hours of diurnal coverage per block, and again, that's over the course of our entire project, and one nocturnal atlasing tip, trip. So birds that we can seek out and focus on this time of year are water bodies, inland and coastal. They're going to attract large numbers of waterfowl and other species of greater, greatest conservation need, which is a state ranking used to determine what conservation actions need to be taken. And species on that list include bald eagle. They're going to be starting to get nesting this time of year too. So it's important to keep an eye on them and use the codes if that's necessary. Another thing that you could look for is blackbird flocks, um, especially the ones in riparian areas, which are wooded areas along streams and rivers. They're going to be hosting to one species that Audubon's definitely been keeping tabs on, the rusty blackbird. 
it winters in the sublime. So that's one that we want to keep monitoring for conservation purposes. Also, during the nighttime, this is a really active time of year. A lot of our um, resident owl species like barn owls, barred owls, and great horned owls are going to start courtship. Uh, and definitely they're going to be nesting and during this late winter period. So keep your eyes out for them. And of course, the wonderful display of an American woodcock, that's something that if y'all haven't seen yet, definitely take a time out dusk or dawn and check those guys out because it is really a neat spectacle that happens each year this time of year. All right, we can move on to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to wrap up here with a brief overview of how the North Carolina Bird Atlas can actually mesh with these other citizen science projects that Ben and Kim have been telling you all about. Um, it really is compatible, especially thanks to that easy eBird portal, which we're using to collect our data. Um, you can use any time you go out birding, you can contribute to the atlas. So, you know, whether it's just a walk through your neighborhood and you're noting some birds or you're getting ready for the great um, backyard bird count and you're gearing up maybe a practice round, definitely go ahead and put that into the um, to the Atlas portal, which will be active during the great backyard bird count. We got confirmation from the folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that you can still use our Atlas portal for that. Um, also, on the Christmas bird count, you may find that your Christmas bird count territory, you know, when you're in the teams set up, uh, like Kim said, you're going to find that you might be in a priority block. So, uh, in those cases, we would definitely love to have your um, Atlas checklist submitted through the portal. And if you're not in a priority block, that's still good data for us too. So um, I, I don't want to overwhelm y'all here. So I want to give the list of some of the resources that you can find. They're on our website. So go to www.ncbirdatlas.org and you'll go through right to our, our eBird portal, which has a lot of really great stuff on it. it. Has a volunteer handbook, which includes winter atlasing tips, how to use the codes, and a rare species list, which is going to include some of the ones that I just mentioned. Also, the priority block sign up, which I see some folks in the chat have already been discussing. If you want to adopt a priority block, feel free to do so. That's what we're relying on some of our volunteers to be the primary atlaser for that block. And that just emphasizes that you're really going to commit to um, providing us atlas data from that block through the course of this project. There's also tutorials and frequently asked questions are answered on our website. And additionally, we often post blogs which discuss birds that may be seen at that time of year, or we also talk about just how to go out atlasing. There's a nice blog up right now about winter atlasing, so I suggest that y'all check that out if you're interested. If you still have questions, you can contact your regional coordinators. They're volunteers and they're listed on the website um, in the Atlas team section. And we also have the project coordinator, Chris Smith. He's with us tonight and he'll be on helping us with the panel. So if y'all have questions for us, please feel free to ask. I'm also joined by Scott and John and Elsa and I think Clayton and Dan are here too. So we have the whole Atlas team here um, and please feel free to reach out if you have questions. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, just to reiterate one thing that Matt said that I love about the Bird Atlas, uh, especially this time of year, is that you can do it while you're doing all these other projects. Matt already said it. I kind of think of it as like doubling your donation. You know, you can double the value of your bird sighting. So, uh, you know, definitely get onto the website, figure out how to turn that eBird portal on so that when you report your sightings, you're contributing to the Atlas. So, uh, with that, uh, I realized that was a lot of information. Again, we're going to follow up with all the links and resources you need to get started on any or all of these community science projects. We're going to now turn to q and I've been taking notes on your questions thus far, um, and you can start posting those in the chat again. And if you are going to be a panelist for this Q&A, uh, if you could please turn on your camera um, and let me know if you're having trouble doing that, and I will... Let's see here. <clears throat> One moment. Great, we've got Chris. Um, Chris, why don't you just introduce yourself really quick and anyone else who's uh, joining us, 
John and Scott um, briefly. Good evening. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for Atlanta um, joining you tonight. Um, I am Christopher Smith. I am the Citizen or Community Science Program Coordinator for the Wildlife Resources Commission. One of those projects is the North Carolina Bird Atlas. Um, I am just one of uh, six people that currently work on this project. Um, I just happen to be titled the program or yeah, program coordinator. So I'll turn it over to Scott. Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Anderson. I'm a statewide bird biologist with the North Carolina Wetlands Resources Commission. And so, yeah, we're all, uh, it's a group effort definitely with us here to, to run the Atlas. I'm really excited for that. For, and thanks for having us here. And, and this is a great, um, I'm excited for the next five years and seeing us cooperate uh, in, the, in that time. John, you want to introduce yourself here? Hey everyone, I'm John Carpenter, uh, Eastern Land Bird Biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, um, based down in Wilmington. So hopefully, I'll run into some some of you here on the the call at some point in the near future. Um, but yeah, thanks to um, Matt, Kim, and, and Ben for the the presentations. That was great, and um, yeah, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Great, thanks everyone. So uh, one thing I wanted to start with. We didn't really get into the details of how eBird works, but that is kind of the, the connective tissue for all of these community science projects is that you log your data through eBird. And I know Chris and Scott have spent a lot of time thinking about how to help people get connected to eBird and make sure you turn on your Atlas portal within eBird so that your data is counting towards the Atlas. So would you guys mind just giving um, maybe a brief thought on the best way for people who are new to eBird to kind of get up to speed? Um, I can take that one. So there's a couple options for you. Um, ncbirdatlas.org is our website where Matt talked about a lot of our tutorials and videos. Um, there are some of the beginners courses that we did our presentations earlier on last year, which um, has Scott really going through, plugging in his phone, showing you how to access eBird, um, what you're using the eBird portal for, uh, I'm sorry, the North Carolina Bird Atlas portal for, how you select it, um, doing your checklist, making sure you're staying within the boundaries of the priority block, which is very key for us. Um, so you can join that. Uh, the Cornell eBird site actually has a lot of tutorials on how to use eBird, um, so great options for that. We'll make sure we include those links directly in the chat um, or send them out to you in the email tomorrow. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm just going to start going through the list of questions that I was writing down during the presentations. Again, all you watching, feel free to start to post those in the comments section right now. Uh, so going back to one that we got on the Christmas bird count, Kim, and I think it could also apply to the Atlas. What do you do if there's not a circle nearby a participant? What's sure. Yeah, and um, it's fine to travel. Lots of people travel. I know some people, I'm planning to do three Christmas bird counts this year, my home one, which I always prioritize, um, as well as Southern Pines in Fayetteville, because um, we've just been spending more time in the Sand Hills region um, in general this year. So yeah, um, it's fine to travel. And also there's a great question about need, like which counts need more people um, I know in my experience, most of the counts up uh, to the north of Winston-Salem, like in, in the mountains, uh, especially in small towns and rural areas, they often really have a significant need uh, for people to count and are, are perfectly, really, really very welcoming of folks traveling around. Uh, it's a great way to get yourself, you know, out on a, a day of birding in the mountains or, you know, in rural parts of the sand hills, the coastal plain. So yeah, I would look out away from the cities and contact those compilers. Seems like a good question for the Atlas as well. You know, where are you guys seeing the yeah. need for people to get to those priority blocks? Um, there, there's a couple of counts that come to mind right off the top of my head, like Roanoke Rapids, Rocky Mount, um, and uh, Kerr Lake. Th those ones, like right off the top of my head, I looked at our Atlas map and saw that we could use some more data there. So if you're planning an Atlas trip and you want to, um, you're interested in contributing some data in some undercovered areas, those might be a couple of the few uh, count circles that you can look at and they do encompass some priority blocks. So like Ben said earlier, you could really double dip there and contribute to two 
community science projects. Yeah, okay, yeah I'll mention. Go ahead, Scott. Sorry. I was just going to mention if you saw that there was a question in the chat earlier about um, the map that Matt had at the beginning, first, his first slide with some of the red blocks and the blue blocks. Um, yeah, you could see those red blocks were the ones that were adopted by, you know, atlasers and the blue block weren't. And those were mostly the more rural areas, not around urban areas. So yeah, almost there's a lot of state that's still available to, um, uh, to contribute to. I'll post that link again in the chat here. Sorry. Yeah, that same priority of math that um, that Scott threw up there for the link to, you can also go in there when you're looking at it, there is a layer in that GIS map that shows the um, priority the, the priority block that we have and the Christmas bird count circles. And you can see where they overlay and overlap. That is an awesome feature. I'm going to check. Um, okay, great. So we just we got a question here in the chat the about the link the relationship between the Merlin app and eBird. Is there anyone who can take that one? Maybe Scott is nodding. <laughs> I don't know that I can. So I, yeah, I don't know the exact. I was starting to type a response to that. Oops. Yeah, I was starting to type a response to that. Um, I don't know the exact relationship. I'm not sure if you have to sign in to in order to contribute from Merlin to eBird. Um, uh, so, but probably you're, you're best off if you want to make sure your data counts towards one of these other projects, you're probably best off just switching to the eBird app that you're already signed in for, into and have an account for and hopefully have, you know, set your portal to the North Carolina Bird Atlas portal uh, and then log it that way. Uh, that's probably the safest way to do it. So, but Merlin, I was going to shout out to Merlin is definitely an awesome app. Um, just this year, they released an ability to identify birds by song through the Merlin app. So it's a really great way to sort of learn. You have to be a little bit careful about whether the song is right or not. You always want to sort of confirm those things. But but it's really great at getting you a lot of the way towards identifying a species, uh, either by giving you a short list or, or giving you a suggestion of a bird that you might be hearing. And I'll jump in really quick because I saw the chat said that the, there was a question regarding your life list on Merlin, and that actually is updated automatically once you've signed into eBird. So like Scott says, just go ahead, go into eBird. It's Since both the apps are Cornell products, they're going to be linked, and it will update your life list for every, in Merlin for every new bird that you report in eBird. Um. Just to briefly address a question we got much earlier in the point we've said a couple of times, but I'll say it again. Someone asked whether they can participate if they're new to American birds, meaning not knowing a lot of them. And, uh, you know, I think all of these projects, you can get involved. Um, some of them are lower barrier to entry than others, but all of them are accessible, even if you're brand new to birds. You know, it just takes a little bit of work, um, fun work, get, you know, learning some basics. Um, but the Great Backyard Bird Count is a great place to start. You can start with the Atlas um, and even Climate Watch where you get to focus on just one species. So uh, certainly don't, don't hesitate, even if you're new. Um, great. This was Bird Count is like a crash course in birding, <laughs> bird identification. Highly recommended. <laughs> And we got a few questions about the Christmas bird count map and the colors of the circles. I know you talked about it uh, briefly during your presentation. Maybe you could go over that one more time and I'll dig up that link again. But we've got some more questions about what the red, green, and yellow circles. <laughs> um, <clears throat> almost all the counts are yellow. So I don't, I don't even know how. The green is, is a little bit elusive. I'm not sure that the compilers are clicking whatever box they need to do to get to green. But basically, you want to focus on the ones that are green or yellow. And if they're red, um, you can click on the circle and see why they're red. I think most of them, I was clicking on these earlier today, most of them just say that they're canceled this year because of COVID concerns. Um, and a couple of them say, we're not accepting new participants this year, sorry, you know, um, for various, various restrictions on, you know, access to land and things like that. So. 
Yeah, there's that map again. Thank you. Let's see, let's just break that map again. And again, you can see that in the bird atlas map using a different GIS layer, which is just great. And I didn't even know that. So two places to see it. Um, so we got this question in the chat just now about how important photo and audio recordings are for these different surveys. I'd be curious to hear the Atlas, what, you know, how important that is for the Atlas first. <laughs> we'll all look at each other to the screen. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, is it important for the Atlas? Um, it depends on what your observations are. Uh, if you have a observation and while you're in eBird and it identifies it as um, a rare species, then yes, if you can record uh, the audio for it, you can get an if picture of it um, that helps to justify and actually prove that that is the bird that you saw. Um, you know, we make fun of Scott all the time because he always throws up his uh, Eastern bluebirds. So do we don't need any more pictures of Eastern bluebirds. We always love looking at them. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we know the distribution. So we're looking for those. So there's there, those rare birds um, that they would be flagged in the portal, yeah, we, you know, if you can get proof and evidence of that, um, even our technicians this summer who were out there, um, they made some observations and they were recording and taking images and, and adding those to their eBird checklist. So it was proof and identification. Proof and identification. And, and I would just add to that and say that you know any of these projects, like uh, I think the Christmas bird count is a great example. Like um, the data you're submitting, who knows how people are going to use that data in the future, and it could be really useful. And you know, we're looking at 120 year data set, which is an amazing data set that can tell us trends over a long period of time. So we're hoping to make the Atlas data similar to that and that somebody 10, 20, 30 further years down the road can look back on the data that we've collected in this five year period and use it as a baseline for some future study. So, uh, so yeah, those are awesome points. And yeah, like if, if you love taking photos and submitting the eBird, awesome. So go for it. Great, thanks Scott. Um, I have a question here specifically about uh, the Christmas bird count and the Atlas. If someone is participating in the Christmas bird count and going out to their circle, do they need to talk with their compiler at all about the Atlas or do they just go ahead and submit those sightings on also through eBird to go to the Atlas? Does that make sense? No? <laughs> do, do, uh, you want to, Scott, do you get that question? I can start. I can start from the Christmas bird count perspective, and then pass it to you, Scott, because um, this is a point I didn't make earlier. But um, the special thing about the Christmas bird count is that your team leader is going to send the data up to the compiler. It's important to know, like we've been talking a lot about eBird. eBird is awesome. That's like the one time where you're gonna, you may put your list in eBird for each park or each site that you visit, but it doesn't automatically go into the Christmas bird count. Super long-term data set. Um, the only way it can get there is through your local compiler who's gonna submit it through a special system. So um, I hope that's not confusing, but, um, but that's great news actually, because it means you can submit eBird checklists happily and some compilers are like, just send me all your eBird checklists for today, and then they compile and submit directly to Audubon. So Scott, from the other angle though, how does that work? No, that that's that's exactly right. And and um, yeah, I think if it, we're encouraging folks to, yeah, you, know, you could probably mention it to your, you know, circle coordinator uh, that you're going to collect for the atlas. But but like you say. Um, it's a separate process for the Christmas bird count. So there's no concern about double counting, I guess, which if, if some people are concerned about that, you can enter it into eBird, you can enter it into our portal and it won't be double counting your Christmas bird count data. So, uh, so yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I have a question about climate watch. I mentioned that, uh, there are multiple target species, um, but you can choose one species. Or you only focus on one species when you do your survey. So for people who are new to birds, it's super convenient. All you have to do is learn one bird, learn it well, 
and you're ready to go. But Kim, could you tell us a little bit about how you pick your bird species or is it chosen for you? <laughs> um, sure. Well, so uh, many of you may know that Audubon and the Wildlife Resources Commission and others have been championing the brown-headed nuthatch for a while now, <laughs> um, encouraging people to put up nest boxes that have just the right size hole for brown-headed nuthatches. But the reason for all that fuss over one cute little bird is that they're, they're in steep decline and they're also just a really high responsibility species. Um, North Carolina hosts a very, very big chunk of the global population of brown-headed nuthatches. So, so that's one that's really important from a conservation perspective. It's on North Carolina's Wildlife Action Plan um, as a priority species. So that's when we always encourage people to consider carefully. Um, but all of the species are, help, it's all helpful and it all helps test the predictions of um, Audubon's climate science. So Eastern bluebirds, you know, a population that's doing really well these decades, right? Um, but it's still important to find out how they're doing. You know, today's stable populations might be tomorrow's um, steeply declining ones. Yeah. So that's what we've been recommending is brown-headed nuthatch or white-breasted nuthatch if you're um, at a higher elevation where brown-headed nuthatches don't really occur. Um, but all the others are fair game. Painted bunting, American goldfinch, whatever you got. Thanks. Um, so I've made it through my list of questions. If I missed any questions, you can repost them in the chat. We have one minute or two left here. Um, and I guess I might... You know, unless we get some more questions, I might end with a question for the Atlas folks. What would you tell people is like, what is the first step that people should do if they want to get involved with the Atlas tomorrow or tonight? Like, what is the first thing they should do? Go to the website? What, what's your recommendation? Yeah, I would start with the website. There's a lot of great ways um, for you to explore before you get committed to that. Um, looking at where you can go basic starts. Um, there is a um, sort of where to get started guide. So there's different options for you. If you're new to atlasing or birding, um, the Atlas is a great way to begin because you can go out, you can download eBird, you can upload your portal, and then atlasing, we want you to make observations. So if it's going to take you a few minutes to identify what bird you're looking at, it's fine. You, you spend that time actually watching the behaviors of that bird in the spring and the summer, and you're recording those observations of what they're doing. Um, and we are trying to um, map out where they are breeding through our state. So it really gets you to slow down, and so you don't have to race through your, your checklist and trying to find every single bird. Um, really focus on the one that you identify, watch it, observe it, and as you're sitting there, all the other ones are going to start popping around, and you can start to edit those to your checklist also. And then all you are is just sitting there watching them. Thanks, Chris. And I think that's a few yeah, I'll Thanks. I'll add quickly. It seems like um, <clears throat> you know a lot of people, especially if you're new to birding, you, you can get a little shy about participating in stuff. And I think the thing that I like about eBird is you can you can identify something just as a gull or a sparrow. So don't let your, if you feel like you don't know everything, that's okay. You know, you can enter in things um, at a much higher level and it's still useful, you know, because we're still counting, you know, numbers of birds. Um, so don't, you know, please don't let that that keep you. And then hopefully as you just learn and, and, and grow with it, you'll be able to start identifying more and more things as you, as you move through it. Um, and I think there was some questions about, you know, our, our NC Bird Atlas portal versus just regular eBird. And, and, and also just, just trust that if you're submitting things to eBird, it's all kept within the eBird universe. Um, so don't feel like you're not gonna be able to find out where your observations are. Um, you know, you can, everything is accessible through eBird. The, the Atlas portal just helps us organize our data and filter our data much more efficiently. Um, so we, we, do, we do recommend that you switch to the portal, the Atlas portal, and, and just, Keep it there for for a while. <laughs> Thanks, John. We uh, one last question here, and then I think we're out of time. Um, got a question a little further up about uh, Chris at Bird Count Circles. And Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if you want to participate, you do need to travel to a circle somewhere. Yes. Um, yeah, so there was a question about from someone who said they live a, an hour away from the closest circle. 
So to participate, you do need to get to one of those circles. But these other, uh, some of these other community science projects, you don't necessarily have to do that. So, um, and it's worth checking out the Atlas priority block map. You might have a priority block. Your house might be in a priority block. You never know. Um, so I think we'll leave it there. I think, uh, again, I'll just, one last time to take a message is that there's something for everyone this winter when it comes to community science. Uh, even if you just started identifying birds yesterday. Um, so I encourage you to get involved, reach out if you have questions, and you'll get an email from us tomorrow with the exact right links you need to get started with all four of these community science projects. So that's it. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists and presenters for helping out today. And uh, have a good night. Have fun counting birds, everybody. Yes.